Love to do that. Be good. Oh, yeah. Be good. Awesome. Catch up with. All right, can I have your attention, folks? I don't really know. Yeah. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, work session tonight. Uh, the uh, main uh, topic of the work session is a discussion on the proposed capital program and strategic plan years 2000, uh, 2021 to 2025. Uh, just to kind of fill some folks in, the, the reason that we're having this is obviously this, uh, you know, in, encompasses some very large expenditures that we have kind of on the horizon in the next three to four years. All of these expenses uh, will come before us individually uh, as time progresses. But the reason for the, the work session is just for us to get maybe a little bit of an idea of what's coming up and maybe a little bit uh, early understanding of why the amount is there and what, uh, what it's gonna be spent for. So that's where we're at. Um, how would we like to start here? Um, questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Joanne and and and, and oh, okay. Go. they're coming. They're 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 about back there. So. You're down here. Yes. Thanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it won't show. We'll make sure we... <laughs> this is a 90 degree weather day. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, there's no. no. Huh? I, I believe that. I was outside all day. I thought I'm not going to wear long day pants all day today. It's too nice and cold. It's too hot. Can she do it with a bent finger? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like you've used that finger. It didn't take long, did it? Right away. <laughs> of course, it would be me, right? What are the odds? Thank well, you. I'm down front, so I'm going to see. Or what is that? So, um, well, this is the I'm second not year. sure Mr. No, Chairman is, quite is really wants to start. Uh, Donna was oh, kind enough to. to Send us the notes that she this has sent to you all. Right. Oh, you I got you. Thank you. you want us to cover first? No, I, I think we. I think best is just an overview of what what can, what is in the capital plan. I guess especially some of the larger expenditures and just you know where we're at on on some of these things and uh, what the uh, future. departments have gotten really good at laying out that whole five years. Others kind of see things in a two or three year increment. Most of them have gotten out of the habit of just seeing the one that's about to get funded. So you will see that both facilities and information systems have done a lot of work over the last couple of years to be able to project out their five years. Um, 
what you'll also see is, is that we recognize as we go through what they've given us that they would like to um, invest in in our capital programs that we don't want to, to tell them, no, you don't have this need. But we do have to look at in the immediately upcoming year that we are also keeping an eye on what's available financially out of the capital tax and the other taxes that support our capital investments. So you will see in for 21, we have greatly gone through, figured out what they're asking for, and tried to match it up with the highest need that they're expressing to us, and then fit that within the budget. When we have things on their original list that we cannot fund, we don't uh, just X them out. We usually ask them if they want to roll it forward for consideration. And if they do, sometimes they want to roll it to the next year. Sometimes they say, I really want to get there, but if I can do it in 23 or even 24, that would be really good because this is a long-term need of our department. So what, we're, what you're seeing very much is in 21, we've tried to match it up with the budget. In 22, 23, 24, 25 in this budget, what you're seeing is, is that we have left their requests largely untouched unless it's something that they can accomplish in another way. So um, you will see a very big difference in the, the fiscal outcome of each year if it was fully funded. And obviously, we cannot fully fund most of these outlying things unless there would be a major change in revenues. So um, again, the plan document shows the needs over five years under those circumstances that I've just described. Um, it also includes detailed maintenance schedules for facilities and information systems. We have a lot of money that's invested in the maintenance of our facilities and also in the maintenance of maintaining the entire infrastructure of our um, information <coughs> systems department. Um, so we also, you will see in this, in this capital document, we don't necessarily include um, like the bond payments or fleet maintenance. Those things actually appear in the budget. But we've given you an insert in this where you can kind of see what those things are. Uh, so 2021 is balanced to expected revenues, including um, laps that we may have from this year. And, uh, but out years are not supported by the document. So a um, few things is um, we have uh, two things about the Justice Center that are in the capital plan for out years. One is the um, conversion of the units on the third floor to direct maintenance, or pardon me, to direct supervision. And obviously, those are things that we can do with in the existing building. Uh, but it, because it's about 800,000 a unit to convert those, we have them planned over four years beginning not in 21, but in 22, because we, we've had the benefit of being able to do the renovation to booking uh, this year. So they'll have some different um, procedures in place because they will have an up-to-date and modern booking facility. Uh, so we, we held that out. We've also got the um, renovation of the remainder of the facility by building the new space in there and it's in for 23, 24, 25 as 30 million, 30 million and 20 million. And in other words, another 80 million to complete the, um, the changeover. And obviously that doesn't happen unless there's a funding source for it. Um, there's also um, 4 million in arena maintenance and improvements right now that are really beyond the ability of the, of the fund to do. And I know some of you have had some questions about how we might be able to do that in future years. Um, the other thing that we wanted to point out is, is that as we go through that exercise in each of the years to come, that what we're seeing is, is that we're gradually having to switch over to accomplishing maintenance or 
fixing things in a bigger way. So a replacement of an HVAC system, or do we limp along with it? And that's moving us towards dealing with things on an emergency basis. Trying not to get there, hoping the equipment continues to operate until we can get to it, but we're very much on a, on a sort of um, pay-as-you-go, which we should be, but pay-as-you-go where we've got a lot of equipment aging out at the same time. It just so happens that when the county built the jail and built this whole complex between 88 and 93, the same equipment is now starting to age out. And here's the, the slide that, that Bob prepared to give you an idea. So the line that you see in pink that talks about um, the capital plan, that's the accumulation of what the departments have asked for. Um, and then below that are the things that we have an obligation out of that capital plan no matter what. We have rental on a facility that we use for maintenance and that we have workforce development in, the family arena bonds uh, have to be paid every year, the EOC bonds, the information systems maintenance contracts, the departmental general maintenance contracts, vehicle maintenance, the cost allocation that gets paid, uh, building renovations, uh, the fleet purchase every year, uh, interfund transfers to pay things that we have an obligation um, from various uh, other funds that have to be paid. Okay, can I ask a question about this slide? Absolutely. Total revenue, the second line across, 12 million and 21, 13, 22, then it jumps to 43, 43, and 34. How do you explain those, those big jumps, Bob? That, uh, Joanne mentioned earlier, in 23, 4, and 5, that includes the 8 million for the, for the jail renovation, 30, 30 million, 30 million, and 20 million. If you're going to include it in the capital plan, the only way you're going to be able to pay for it is to have another source of revenue. So I've added 30, 30, and 20 to the revenue side just to keep the bottom line of what you wind up with at, at any fund balance, um, reflective oh. of what our, our fund balance okay. is. What, and fund so balance that is projected is. revenue, assuming we get additional funding of some one sort. Correct. Or right. The, the okay. actual, the actual real. If that doesn't happen, the actual revenue is going to be somewhere around twelve to thirteen million. Right. 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 Okay. Subtract so thirty, okay. thirty, and twenty. Okay. Fourteen million. Right, that's all I need to know. Yeah. And that first line is the beginning fund balance. So that's assuming the lapse from the previous year. Um, as you, uh, as we had an extensive discussion about last year, as you know, the amount of funds lapsing from year to year is in general decreasing. Uh, that's in part because uh, we have especially two very um, good department directors who are getting their projects done year to year. So both Matthew and Christine, if they propose something, uh, they've been getting it done. Um, this year is a little bit unusual because of the COVID situation. Um, but um, other than that, uh, if they propose it, they've, they've been getting it completed. And of course, while that's great, it also means we reduce we lapse less than, uh, than we had in the past. Um, the facilities management plan, uh, I know Christina is here, do you want to see that? Would you like my spot? You want to go to the podium? Yeah. Okay, so on our facilities management budget, if you're basically looking at the budget in terms of what does it take to operate the building, what does it take to maintain or upkeep the existing infrastructure or improvements, and then also building modifications, in an ideal world, we'd be really asking for $5 million. Two million of it would be for our general operations. How do you keep the lights on? How do you keep everything operating? That would roughly take $2 million every year. If we go to improve our infrastructure, we have, as Joanne mentioned, aging mechanical systems, aging electrical systems, plumbing. We have roofing that's still 20 years old plus that, that needs help. Certainly the last few storms proved that. 
Uh, we also have uh, parking lots, a lot of problems in some of our parking lots. So if you go through and you add up all of those things and you chip away that over mm -hmm. a few years, or not just a few years, many years, you still need about $2 million to address those. Then the last piece of it is, is making modifications. We can't continue to provide the services in the same way we did 30 years ago or 20 years ago. Technology has proven things can change and we need to adapt to that. But our physical infrastructure of our building, our physical walls, the physical way we, we do our business, our real estate does not support how it should be done today. So that's kind of where that million dollars comes from. So in an ideal world, $5 million. But this year, we're asking for 3.5. Because we can get by with that. We're doing a few modifications this year with some pretty major mechanical systems. Uh, but it's, it's a little bit of a drop in the bucket compared to what we need to be doing. We've got in our construction management, so construction and facilities, it's, it's now all under facilities management. But the construction side, we really stripped that down. That's, that actually has a rollover of one of the projects we needed to complete this year, but COVID and a few other things really impacted our ability to get some things done. So we're having to roll some of that into next year. So a total of 3.5 million. But you look forward to 2022 through 2025, and our HVAC replacements, over $5 million. Again, I don't get it all done, but I'm making headway there. In our roofing, and replacements, that's 2.7 million. That's a pretty substantial amount just for roofing material. In the Justice Center, as, as Joy had mentioned, we have a lot of things that we really need to be doing, but just general upkeep. Because the wear and tear that happens in that building, year in and year out, if I just barely get in there and do some of those repairs to keep it going, that's another $843,000 over the, that four year period. It's a, it's a large investment, but I'm not improving the facility. <coughs> So if we go to the next slide. Before you do that, let yes. me ask you, on, mm -hmm. how many HVAC, HVAC systems, uh, how are you determining that they need to be replaced? Is somebody actually going out and looking at those? Is somebody telling us that they're just about shot? Or yeah, is it, it just... We think they're going to be. It's a fair question. So generally speaking, your HVAC equipment will last anywhere from 15 to 25 years, depending on what it is. We do have boilers in the jail that have lasted seven years. It's not long, but at the heavy rate in which they're used, yeah, we've had to replace them. The HVAC that I'm considering here, that is actually pure mechanical systems, not a boiler unless it's a boiler to feed the mechanical systems. So this building, for example, 41 different uh, heat units just to, to serve this building. All 41 need to be replaced. That's not an inexpensive endeavor. You've got six floors in the courthouse. Each individual floor has, a, has an air handler that supplies it. Those kind of really big systems, unfortunately, as Joanne mentioned, the years in which we built these buildings in 88 to 93 are our largest buildings. They have very large 80-ton units, multiple within the building. Jail alone has 15 different units. Those are all original. We need to replace original equipment when it's that old. Because we're getting to the point where if we have a failure, how are you going to get the parts? How are you going to get the things operational? How do you even order an 80-ton unit that's not off the shelf? It's going to take 12 weeks at least. So I don't want to shut down a floor in the courthouse. So we need to replace them. But we also, and I, Go ahead. Yep, I want to make sure that as we're going forward, we do assess. We do bring in an engineering firm. Are we doing this the right way? Systems change. The use of the building changes. That can influence how we need to do our mechanical systems as well. So we sort of have a double check there to make sure what we're doing is correct and make sure it's still viable. Um, I guess my concern, I would want to have those systems evaluated by an expert and mm -hmm. give us a, an idea because I know those units are, are those commercial units outlast residential units, which usually oh, last about 15 or 20 years. But I would think they would be more like 25 or 30 before those systems needed to be replaced, just from my experience. Sure. And uh, so I, I, I would suggest we have somebody 
take and a we, look at those. We can do that. We've we've talked had many conversations about a a consultant coming in and doing a condition assessment, trying to find a way to do that but without costing the county money. Because clearly, I don't have the additional funds to hire somebody to go through the the 17 buildings plus 18 buildings if you count Family Arena for us to assess the systems. So. It's, it's not an inexpensive endeavor. We're looking at ways that we can slice and dice that and try and accomplish that without a cost to the county. So we're working towards that. Um, Excuse me, so you don't have employees here who would go out on a regular basis. Oh, we do. regular would be to check to make think, sure things Absolutely. are working and to troubleshoot, you do that. We do. We have three current staff and we actually just were able to, well, we have an offer out to hire yet a fourth one for specifically just HVAC. And it is actually of their opinion that we, we do replace it. Our supervisor for HVAC has been with us for over 20 years. He is the one helping us to determine, because he's limping it along. He's helping it out. He's, he's telling us where we have the, the serious problems. And yes, sure, we want to validate his opinion. But at 23 years of, of county experience in, in the systems that, that came on shortly after he started, and he's still maintaining them, I do trust that, that he does know when we, are, we need to replace mm -hmm. certain systems. Well, and having, having you said that, I feel better about it, okay? Okay. That, that we've got somebody that's Oh, absolutely. It's not just my opinion to say, to, hey, I think it needs to get done. That knows yeah. when these systems are getting worn and it happens. Mm -hmm. So yep. that, thank you. Sure, Mr. Cronin. I own quite a few commercial buildings and I've dealt with those commercial HVAC systems for mm -hmm. 30 years, okay? And just a couple of things. Your normal technician guys that you have on the payroll can tell you the condition of those units, okay? Mm -hmm. The hard part is figuring out how to replace them, and that's where you need engineering. Mm -hmm. when, from what my experience is on the older <coughs> units, 30 years, 35 years, that's tops, okay? Mm -hmm. And the new stuff doesn't last that long, but the new stuff is significantly more efficient. Yes. And like one building, I had three big rooftops, one of them, the biggest one being a 25, no, 30 ton unit. Mm -hmm. And we replaced it with two smaller units because the new ones run so more efficient. Right. But one thing on one of the other buildings, I, I, Brent, Donna Vote had come up with some highlights and we was working with Brett Statler. And, and one of the reasons listed for some of the replacements was the R22 is, is very expensive and hard to get right now. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you what a lot of the private guys are doing. They're pulling that when you get, when you like if I replace an old unit with a new unit, mm -hmm. they're sucking that R22 out, recycling it, and you, they'll actually too. give it back to you and you can use it in your other units. Yes, my staff do that okay. as well. But just one suggestion to you, I know you guys are tied in with train real tight because that management system that you use, but when you open the door to more vendors and train, you're going to get more competitive bidding probably. That's just a comment that I have. Well, okay. we're looking at that. Yeah. And, and I reassure you, absolutely, we are reclaiming every bit of our refrigerant because it is so expensive. In fact, I do believe it's, ridiculous. it's in 2021 it is no longer being manufactured. Yeah. Yeah. So it is ridiculous. Yeah. And we do recycle. We do maintain it. And we try to our best to, I mean, my HVAC staff do amazing things. The fact that some of our systems, in fact, the boiler that serves this very building, we don't know the age of it. There is no placard anywhere on that boiler. And every other year when the, the Missouri uh, inspector comes out to check out the boiler, he's, he literally tells us, I don't want to see it next time. This thing is too old. And yeah, it's functioning. But I can tell you, nobody really understands how it's still functioning. It could be 50 years old. Yeah. It's likely to be 50 years old. So they're very good at what they do, and I'm grateful for them. And they do everything they can to maintain our systems on a minimum cost spot. But we're at that point. We're just getting to that point where you can no longer keep maintain, maintain, maintain. You need to replace. And I agree with Mr. Hammond. You do need to bring in an engineer to, to help us determine what is the right methodology, because they'll help us determine. You don't need to, you don't need 180 ton, you need to 30 tons, whatever you the could, approach may you be. You could start standardizing some of the units too. I mean, I'm starting Absolutely. to do that and buying the same brand and the same model because then there's some cost advantages that way and also it's a lot easier to replace if you got one. And one when you have down. the same parts on the shelf, it makes life a lot easier too. Because you know about curbs and curb adapters and yep. all that stuff, that's a pain in the butt if you have multiple brands and types of mm -hmm. units out there. Yep. You got a tough job, lady. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so any other questions before we move on to the Justice Center? 
so just a, a quick recap as far as the Justice Center. So when we, we had the conversation with you back uh, last fall, our operational challenges within the Justice Center, just a reminder that this booking project is going to do great things for the, for the Justice Center it, to help with their intake of, of the inmates. But it still isn't, isn't handling the indirect supervision that's needed, or excuse me, it's not taking care of that. It needs to be direct supervision. It's also not taking care of the small and flexible housing units for housing the assignments of the variety of types of inmates that we have, the difficult working conditions and how you can move easily and quickly within the facility, the lack of programming space and natural light that are requirements for the inmates, as well as uh, needing to have additional staff to maintain the current type of operations. So lack of efficiency there. As far as the physical building, we already touched on it, the age of the building, 30 plus years old. Um, populations are exceeding what it was originally designed for. And then outdated security controls, we're really limping that along every single year. And the fact that we've had so much deferred maintenance on that building. Those things are not covered in full in this budget. And then if we're able to find the funding, which we know we have to find the funding, but based on what we've already are working on improving this year, we have approximately 80 million left to be able to make the modifications to improve the jail to bring it up to an efficient building that it needs to be in order to support the growing county that we have. Because unfortunately, crime just doesn't go away. In 20, or on page 19 of it, the, you see that there's 800,000. We can go through and chip away $800,000 every single year to handle the uh, direct supervision, moving it towards direct supervision. Can't do it in every single housing unit, but where we can do it, it's approximately 800,000, so we can accomplish that over a four-year period of time. That's a different than the 80 million. Can coincide with the 80 million, though. Refresh our memory. Why are we converting to direct supervision? Because it's less manpower for the jail staff. Is that That's correct? That's correct. Okay. It Absolutely. Really increases his ability to handle the the jail at the kind of levels that he is right now. Because if he stays indirect. He's 40 some odd staff short of where okay. he should be. And I think you did this study, I think you gave it just before, the cost savings and employee costs would exceed what the cost to convert to direct, yeah. physical cost to convert if, the buildings to direct service. If he was fully staffed on Long -term. Ships, it would be over $2 million. Okay. Yeah, okay, thanks for refreshing my memory on that one. Yep. Well, I can tell you that of all types of construction from hospitals to to uh, office buildings and everything else. The most expensive construction is a prison yes. because of life safety requirements and, and dealing with the security of them. When it comes to square footage cost, uh, a prison is probably the most expensive building that you can build these days. I concur, it absolutely is. And you know, the, the actual construction of the new booking center on the second floor, um, Councilman Schneider went through with us one day very nicely. And one of the things we were showing her that you would appreciate is, is they were, uh, you know, pulverizing the old floor to be able to put in the, the new uh, areas. Uh, they came across some electrical lines that were live, including one that was 480. Mm -hmm. And um, the sleeve that it was in was completely corroded away and the, lot, the, the wire was live. So they were saying, you know, at some point encased in concrete down there, it would have simply shorted out and stopped functioning. The jail would have been dark and we wouldn't have had any idea why. So it's, it's stuff like that that, it, you know, 32 years of use, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, with the kind of moisture that gets in that building in various ways, it's just got a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. I would just say a thank you very much for arranging for me to come through that. It's in my <clears throat> district, so we uh, trot over there on a really hot day, I guess the Friday before last. And um, it, I was amazed to see um, how diligent everyone has been in terms of the plans, the uh, proceeding with building and there's a lot going on over there and I really am impressed with the thought. I looked at the plants and, and how a lot of that is going to be affecting 
um, you know, the COVID situation, they're putting in all special cells for containment of people who test positive or who are suspected. Um, there's just a lot of thought and care and expertise that's gone in there. And I have to tell you, after seeing that, um, I felt that um, the people who had been selected for the management and for the building were top notch professionals and they really seem to be working very, very hard in order to meet our deadlines. So it was pretty impressive. It is. I've Thanks. got a question for you. Yes. Okay. We've had this discussion before. I, I know from personal experience from crooks that have gotten taken advantage of me, the ones in jail, that jail right now, that it takes a long, long time before the cops pick them up and they get charged, okay, especially they have no money for a public defender, before they actually go to court and get educated, okay? So my question would be this, uh, and I think part of that problem is it's the state's best interest to keep them in the county jail as long as they can because they're not paying for them. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're right. being charged, but they're not yeah. paying their bill. Right. At the same token, it's the, the state. The feds are paying, though, I think. It's the state, that's, the state that's also hiring the public defenders, who there's not enough, which keeps them in the jail longer. So Joey and I have talked, talked Joanne and I have talked about this. So instead of spending $80 million on the jail, can we lighten the load up on the jail by, by actually maybe hiring county public defenders to get those guys, either cut them loose if, or, or if they go on probation or they're innocent, or get them to the prison and get them the heck out of that jail. Is that something that's feasible in your opinion, in your opinion? Um, you know, it's such a complicated situation. Um, you know, like I said, you have to, these people have the right to have an attorney and one has to be appointed for them. Um, the state is having the same budget issues that the county is having. I think they've put more money lately into the public defender system but sometimes the public defenders, we've had the problem where they were deciding what their workload should be and they were kind of slow walking, I think, some of those cases, to be honest with you, and uh, complaining that they didn't have the resources to adequately represent all of the um, defendants to, to whom they have been assigned to represent. Uh, and then you've got the issue now where, you know, the Supreme Court has been working on this thing that seems to be popular about uh, letting people go, not requiring cash bail. So maybe we're not having some of those people in the jail. It's really hard to predict, predict what the numbers are gonna be in the future. Um, we've had some issues where the courthouse was closed down because attorneys had come in for various cases and ended up testing positive. So uh, last I checked, I talked to somebody yesterday, one of the judges, everything's open right now. But if they get another positive case, they're going to, you know, shut down maybe the jail, I mean, the courthouse again. That's going to keep backing people up. So there are a lot of cases that are backed up, a lot of uh, jury trials that have been delayed because of the inability to get jurors in there and have them safely uh, sitting on these cases. So it's really hard to predict in the future. But right now, I would say to you that it's going to be, um, it's not in the future that I see it, that we're going to have a significantly less population in the jail. Did you like this instance? This guy was a thief with 64 pages on case net of thievery, mm -hmm. drug uh -huh. addict problems, stuff like that. Yeah. He ripped off area businesses for over $100,000, tons of evidence against him. He's been in that jail for darn near going on a year, okay, and the court cases are just coming up, okay? Mm -hmm. So that to me just, I mean, you got a, a, a pretty much hardened mm -hmm. criminal gets caught red-handed, it still takes a year from the time you, the police put him in there to the courts, <coughs> send him on to Jeff City. You know, that's, that seems, I, that's what I'm having That seems with. very unusual to me. I mean, first of all, you know, if the case doesn't go before the grand jury, the person's entitled to a preliminary hearing. So first they have to get an attorney, then they have to set up for a preliminary hearing, then the prosecutor has to get the witnesses in, and then the case gets continued four or five times, and then the, the courthouse is shut down so, and then even after they have the preliminary hearing, then the case gets bound over for trial. It starts all over again with an arraignment and assignment to a new judge. And I mean, the, the procedure, the process. That's what takes it. Takes a long time, yeah. We need Judge Roy Bean. Okay. <laughs> Bob, do you know how much the state owes us for, <clears throat> for our jail? A little jail? over a million dollars. <laughs> oh, how Lord. much? A million dollars, a little over. When did, do they pay us a, a little bit every once in a while or what? Yeah, we, uh, I checked on this a while back and we were getting small payments periodically. But the oldest, the 
the oldest amounts are, are well over a year old. Is it 32 million statewide? It is. Yeah. It's about 32 million statewide. So what they normally do is they take the biggest chunk of it after they get their appropriation on July 1. And they, they parcel it out. They parcel it out. <laughs> yeah. They used yeah. to have a formula, the first in, first out, but they got, they had some fairly big jurisdictions who were always late to getting their bills in, so they kind of stopped that. Yeah. So everybody gets something, as I understand it, and then they kind of stop, and they wait to see if there's lapse in any of their other payment programs, and they might transfer it over there, which is the smaller amounts that. Yeah. Bob's talking about, but mostly what, Very we frustrating. Get, <laughs> what we get this month is probably what we're going to get, except for some small payments in the spring. Do the feds pay good? Yeah, they yeah, do. They do. Yeah. They're prompt and okay. timely. Can our state senators do anything to get us our million bucks? Well, if they got us our million bucks, they got to come up with about 31, eight, I think it is, for the rest of the state who are yeah. all mad too. We're, we're not that high on the priorities list. And you know, with the medic, the, um, you know, the amendment two passing, we're going to be looking at some real problems with budgeting. Mr. Eaton, we have get worse. So I was just curious, when we went through the whole jail plan, I think we had four different plans that we looked at. We agreed on the $93 million rehab plan. Is that correct? Yes. So that's the plan. That but we'll you, I do want to just correct you about one thing. You all did not vote that night. We recommended that. We were near the end of the meeting time. The meeting, uh, as I remember, the real meeting was supposed to start. And you said that, you all said that sounds good. But there wasn't actually an adoption of yeah. that. Yeah, I, I had that same question. Oh, Mike and I, I remember having that discussion with Joanne a while back. I'm like, you know, I assume this is what we're doing, but I don't remember that we took a formal vote on it. You did not. All right, so that changes my question. Go ahead. So where do we sit on this? If, if I was, I've been working under the impression since that meeting that we agreed, and perhaps it was just me, so sorry for being uninformed, but I thought that we agreed we were moving forward with the $93 million rehab plan. So where yeah. do we sit on that? Well, my, my, we my can't recollection, spend money until we have it. Yeah. My recollection was that we, we, we agreed as a group, but we not with vote. a formal vote. Yeah. It was no Is formal vote. Yes, exactly. All right, so are we still waiting on that formal vote to be taken to move ahead with that program? Or I'm we, seeing, I'm seeing we no. We need a formal vote that that's what you all concur in, but we also need funding to be able to do it. There was no source of funding to Okay, do so that. again, yeah, I thought we talked about that evening that I thought we talked about a bond program to raise that money. Did I misunderstand that as well? That would be the vehicle under which we would pay for the project, but you have to have the, the annual funds available to meet to the obligation the for the debt service. Okay. And that's, that's the missing component. We don't have a level of Sales tax revenues to afford the bond payment on a $93 million project. Yeah. Okay, so in all fair, in all fair hang on, let me let me finish Sorry. this thought before you all jump in because I, I got this was pre COVID. We had these discussions. I'm with you, I'm with you. I, I get 2020 is a completely different year, so I'm, I'm gonna guess based upon your wonderful presentation that Matthew's probably going to come up here and tell us about how the IS department is woefully unfund unfunded and he's doing everything he can to keep all this stuff together too. You're probably not going to say that now that you just shook your head no. So uh, sorry for shielding yours. And Ryan is going to tell us how great the parks department is because it has a funding source and it's, it's kick and tail and taking names because we have everybody and the brother who wants to get out of the house and go to a park where they can all six foot distance and we love our parks they're great we're done that's awesome so we're completely done <laughs> I'm just i know i know we're going to walk through this but i i want to wrap my head around this first <coughs> this this looks like um a, a five-year plan that says we have no money and we're woefully short so can we cut to the chase or do we have to wait to the end to find out how are we going to fund it? Or am, am I just, should I be patient and sit and wait for the next hour for us to get there? We're almost near the end of the presentation. Okay. <laughs> Matthew. Okay. 
House members, Executive Elman. Um, last year, the IS department had a lot of replacement. And so like you, like Christine mentioned earlier, how kind of maintaining equipment, maintaining equipment need to replace. Well, the IS department went through a replacement of a lot of equipment over the last 12 to 18 months. So we're in a position now where we are starting to maintain that equipment and actually coming up with a schedule so that we are maintaining that in a uh, systematic approach so that we don't wait for a catastrophic failure to replace items, that we're replacing them on a proper schedule. So that's what we went through and we presented to, a, I think, a number of you um, earlier this year to talk about a five-year capital plan with the IS department and what we were doing and how we we're utilizing those funds, uh, which is in this plan tonight and, and, and I'm happy with the amount that is in there. And so I appreciate the help of the executive office and finance uh, department uh, with providing that, what, what I kind of put forward and that plan is being in the plan that's with you tonight. Uh, that's the first bullet point of what's in there. What you'll also see is in there is that we're continuing to upgrade and our cameras and our door access system uh, across all the county facilities so that we're all in one system. Uh, it's an updated system with card access and uh, it makes it more secure for our employees as well as visitors uh, who are visiting our facilities. What you'll also see in there is uh, building out our uh, fiber network to county facilities. And I think this is an important one because the more facilities that we bring on to uh, our private fiber is less money that we are spending in the operations side uh, towards a internet service provider uh, or somebody who we're leasing fiber from. Uh, that puts it in our back pocket. That's something that we can use and we never have to pay uh, an agency or another entity for those costs. That's, that's something that we start to see benefit on immediately once it's connected uh, to those facilities. And so we have some continuation of funding in there the five years to kind of bring on all of our uh, areas onto the fiber. We're also working on cybersecurity. Uh, that's a huge uh, importance. I think you'll see uh, pretty much uh, every day there's probably a news story out there that you can uh, read up on of a company that has had a data breach uh, and so we're making sure we're taking a concerted effort, looking at how our systems are set up, making sure that we're secure and we're keeping this, the information of the county secure uh, in terms of employee records and, and other records that are in, in our you know, databases, uh, making sure that those are secure. So that's something that's obviously at the top of our list as well. And finally, you know, there are uh, departments who uh, need to upgrade their applications and different upgrades that go on in their departments. And so you'll see in the, in the budget uh, that there are some, uh, some applications that need to be upgraded. And, and those departments have put that in there and, and our department is there to help assist, uh, work through that process and get that stuff implemented for them uh, so that they're being able to be more effective and more efficient with the tax dollars uh, for the residents of the county. So uh, that's a summary of, of what's in the budget for the IS department and uh, answer any questions you may have. Sir. I have the previous <coughs> capital plan too, okay? So, and in 2020, it showed for your department about 8.8 .8 million. Is that about where you're at? Or are you under that? Or what do you think you're at for expenditures? We're a little under that. Um, not by much, but we're, we're a little okay. under Okay. So basically, and then, for instance, last year, it was 8.8 .8 .8 projected for this year. And then it was about a steady 4 million a year going out. So now you're, you're cutting it back where you're asking for five and then the long-term cost dropped about 3.3, 3.4. So essentially you're asking for less, just to be clear, mm -hmm. than what you got this year. Yep. And then our overall cost, because the savings that you implemented should go down somewhere close to a million dollars a year for the next four after. That's correct. Okay, well what I'm getting at is what we, what we need to do for every county department is what that guy's doing, okay? Because he caught, chopped three million dollars off his capital expense and a million dollars a year off of his future costs. And reality is, yes, we could use more money, but if we can't get more money, then we've got to do what he did, okay, for county department by county department. So I congratulate you. I looked at the numbers. I thought you, that was, uh, that, you're going in the right direction. Thank you. Moment 
decided that they need to replace the system or the new technology comes out that they've got to have. So there's, there's things that are unknown for the IS department in terms of major projects that will change that number over time. Mm -hmm. But he does have a very solid and clear maintenance plan that mm -hmm. we've not had before, which is a serious but when you look, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but yeah. when you look at it, he's spending less and getting more efficient in, in long-term cost. You could have another department come in in three years and have a million-dollar system that they want. Blow the numbers all up. that year, and it would just okay. blow Okay. We'd make sure that it went into their budget. Into <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Tell them to build the St. Louis County or something, too, if they can. And okay. Matthew's also at the end of about a two-year process where we finally got done the implementation and updates that we've been saying for like five years needed to be done. And through you know some management processes that started in the department right before he came, and then that he's continued through very efficiently, we've gotten those things done. And it's very similar to what Christine's saying about uh, facilities. You, you go ahead and you put the new technology in place, it's more efficient. And it's going to, now you're at the front end of it. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Appreciate hey, it. Hey, before Matthew oh, leaves, yeah. um, I did want to say congratulations and great job on the county website on all of the COVID tracking. I understand that you and your department had a lot to do with building out uh, the upgrades that we've had and specifically laying out all that information by school district, um, which school district is bit of a hot topic as we know right now, um, duh, but uh, it's great to have that information. So I really appreciate it. I know a lot of people are looking at these different tabs with the different school districts that are on the website. So I appreciate you guys and uh, that's a great job because a lot of people had to go out of house to build things like that. So it's nice to have the talent in house to be able to do that. Yeah, Paul and my department and uh, the health department have been awesome collaboration, working together, making sure we're getting the data that we need along with the executive office and working with other agencies on what data they want. And it's all there. We just kind of have to, you know, get it in yeah. the right format to show, you know, it on the, to the public. So I know uh, it's all a work in progress, but I appreciate the progress that you've made so far. So nice job. Thank you. The teachers are real happy with that too. Yeah, everybody loves more information and those, I know Joanne and I have talked, we, there's a lot of data, but it's not necessarily parsed very well. So we get all kinds of data, but sorting through all that stuff is, is tough. You ready, Ryan? Ryan, come on up. <laughs> you saved the good news guy, right? <laughs> Uh, good evening. Exactly. <laughs> good evening. Uh, thank you all have received uh, the park strategic plan that we put together um, for uh, 2020 through 2025. Um, just talking uh, through some points here. Um, the first couple pages, you can see where our current park age group sits at. It's currently sitting at just under 4,000 acres at 3,947 acres. 17 open parks with three parks uh, in holding. Um, on page five, you can see where all those parks are located throughout the county, pretty much showing that we have pretty good spread throughout the county uh, where our parks are at. Um, there's some information on the Parks Advisory Board and the Parks Foundation. Uh, some operating goals uh, that we have of just increasing visitor uh, satisfaction, customer satisfaction. We do regular polls of people who rent facilities to us. And then this past year, we've also started a program called Six Foot Ranger Surveys, where we uh, interact with uh, the public and ask them about our parks and get feedback on what they are happy with and what they would like to see and those sorts of things. Um, we have a goal of achieving 1.3 website visits annually by 2025. Um, and in 2025, we hope to achieve an annual attendance of 3.25 million. Um, with the COVID epidemic, as uh, I think uh, Councilman Elam mentioned, uh, there's a real big desire to get outside and be out in the nature. And we've seen that increase throughout our numbers. In 2019, uh, we had 2.5 million people, which was an all-time record of park visitation uh, to our parks. 
Uh, at the end of July, we were 1,800 people shy of hitting 2019's record. Um, so people are coming out, um, uh, finding our parks for the first time. I think I sent out an email uh, from a citizen who has traveled all around the United States and uh, was just so pleased that he found these parks uh, in their own backyard. So give you a, uh, moving on to page 11, um, where we, we talk about maintenance goals and, and operating of the parks. Um, page 12 shows our current uh, inventory and liability of our acreage, tent sites, cabins, picnic tables, trash cans, uh, lakes, those sorts of things. Um, moving on to our programming goals, increasing programming and partnerships um, is obviously a, a good goal to have. You can see here on page 16 the 2019 numbers in terms of rentals, um, park visits and programs and special events uh, which were up. Um, this year with COVID, we've had to cancel a number of programs, reduce some, some programs and, and get creative. Uh, some of our more uh, creative programs and some of our new programs have actually sold out to the point to where we've added additional nights and additional, uh, you know, smaller groups, but uh, more nights uh, available. So we're pretty, uh, I'm pretty proud of our program staff and, and the offerings that they're uh, doing here during this uh, pandemic. So um, on page 18 through 19, uh, you can see uh, some of our goals to develop those those parks and holding um, as well as increasing our acreage uh, from you know 3,610 acres which was in 2018 uh, to approximately 4,500 acres in uh, 2025 through acquisitions partnerships those sorts of things um, additional trails walking uh, paths um, increasing lodging uh, Klondike and Indian Camp Creek are only two parks right now where you can camp um, Klondike has cabins and tent camping. It's a very popular thing. We think um, what we're seeing a national trend with uh, obviously the COVID stuff that people are wanting to find these staycations and they're identifying places around their state and around their community where they can go out and go out for a weekend or even longer um, without having to travel a, a great distance. Uh, we think that's going to be the new norm for a while um, and we hope to increase those those opportunities for people to come out and and to enjoy our parks and everything st charles has to offer uh, when we get into uh, page 20 and 21 you can see some some nice uh, bar graphs uh, that we created uh, you can see that the number of parks has increased from 2005 or from eight in 2005 uh, to 20 in uh, 2020. You can see a dip there where we went from 21 down to 20 when we combined a couple parks to form New Melly Lakes. So that's why that went down. We didn't get rid of the park. <laughs> um, you can see our acreage has gone up uh, from 2005, uh, 2,048 acres in 2005 to just under 4,000 acres in 2020. Um, and in the last seven years, we've added almost 1,000 acres to our park system. Um, then the corresponding page here, you can see that staffing levels have remained relatively level um, throughout um, in 2017 or 2013. You can see we had 51 staff members and in 2020 um, we have 60 staff members. So we added 1,000 acres in that time period and uh, have added uh, just nine uh, staff members in that time. So you can see that we've, we maintain uh, a good park system uh, without you know trying to grow we've been growing responsibly uh, throughout this time um, you can see in 2016 to 2019 the uh, program attendance the number of programs and events and the facility rentals over the last four years and then when we get to uh, what we're talking about here today on the following pages here of the upcoming construction projects we outline um, some of the priorities from 2020 to 2025 uh, really focusing on that idea of developing new things that are going to bring more people and additional revenue into the park system. Um, you can see the Youth Activity Park is the number one um, project goal here. We're currently on design for a redesign, a rebranding, rethinking of the Youth Activity Park. Uh, you might be interested to note that this year we opened up the world's largest pump track. And in 19 days since we opened up that park uh, from the pump track, we eclipsed 2018's annual attendance. Wow. So in 19 days, we eclipsed a whole year's attendance at that park. So it's very popular, and I think we're on the right track of bringing a lot of people out. That's going to increase uh, the use and right uh, revenue for there. I see what yeah. you did there. We're on the right track. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Pump <laughs> track. Ah. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can see uh, some additional planning through here, um, including 
you know, opened up Madison Hill Park, um, Missouri Bluffs Park, adding some amenities into that. Uh, the park at New Melly Lakes, we're under design right now for master planning uh, for anticipated construction next year for the uh, north side of Forest Hill Road. Um, that would bring additional revenue opportunities into that park. We're close to the lawn house being open. But um, you can see everything that's laid out here. Um, in terms of the parks and the, and the big picture of operating, um, you see on, uh, I guess it's what page, I don't know, 29. Um, it's it costs approximately uh, $11.2 million uh, to operate the parks in our current system right now. About $10 million of that is in operations, uh, $1.2 roughly in, in capital, um, which includes transfers in, into the general fund to support um, you know, uh, the, the, the other departments that we use, as well as pay the police department, which is our ranger force. Um, the general revenue, uh, the general tax uh, generates just a, a little over $12 million annually. Um, and then an additional $2.5 million is uh, generated through uh, other revenue sources, including programs, rentals, um, those sorts of things. Um, this provides about $3.5 million for land acquisitions, um, development, and land held in reserve, those sorts of things. Um, so in 2021, um, you'll see some big projects. Um, those big projects are kind of wrapped up into two major projects, which is the Youth Activity Park and the Park under Mellie Lakes. Um, but like I said, we're trying to bring more people out there, um, provide more revenue uh, streams from those parks. So that's the strategic plan in a nutshell. Yes, Council Manning? So um, how have the canoe rental and uh, paddleboard thing. How's that been going? Awesome. That looked like a really cool program. It's, it's a very cool program. Uh, we're very proud of the way it's uh, been going this year. We were their first out-of-state client out of the state of Minnesota. So with anything, there's some growing pains on, you know, of operations, just making sure we get everything all lined out. But um, we have the most rentals um, than anywhere in the nation right now. Wow. Uh, so he's actually got rentals now in Texas now and Minnesota. Um, so it's a very, very popular program. Um, right now, um, in June and July, uh, we generated uh, just about seventeen or seven thousand, eight thousand dollars on our, on rentals. Um, but um, it's been very popular. Are we looking at expanding that at all? And that's something that we are looking at expanding as as more parks open, as Riverside opens up. We hope to have some some Blue Way. Um, you know connections that would allow people to get on some streams and rivers in the county and be able to canoe uh, and kayak back and forth from different parks um, we're working on uh, a plan and talking with the city of winsville uh, parks department uh, and hopefully working on a way to allow some program ca canoeing and things on the on big creek and, and some of the other major uh, waterways up north um, so we're we're pretty excited about that opportunity to expand that in the future cool mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Scott. Ryan, yes. when is uh, Hideaway Harbor going to be dredged? So you'll see, you'll see there is some money put in there for Hideaway Harbor next it's year. It's been there for over a year. And uh, we had a bid. We had we received one bid to dredge that out, and the, the person um, that submitted the bid wasn't able to get the insurance requirements, I believe, was the hold up on it, and it wasn't able to complete the work. It is something that we're working on doing, and we hope to get that I mean, done. The river's here. down now, and I mean, if you pumped it out, you could probably do it with a bulldozer. But I have to tell you right now, I'm not going to vote for to approve anything with parks until that lake's done. It's yep. been almost two years, and I want it to get done. Yep. We just got this tonight. In mm -hmm. all fairness to you, I'm going to do some studying. Okay. okay? But I do have some questions and some concerns about some of the expenditures in here, and I'll I'll just send them on to you. Okay. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Anybody else have any questions for Ryan? Yeah. Do you ever foresee doing any RV camping in any of the parks? We're planning on uh, some RV camping here as part of this this development uh, in 2021. Would so, it be like primitive RV camping? No, it'll be full hookup is what oh, we're wow. we're shooting for right now. Wow. That's great. All right. Anyone else? Thank you, Ryan. Yep. Yeah. All right. Are we to the part now when Mr. Elam will get to the brief? <laughs> do, we, do we get to find out the answer to that question? Well, I got we'd I got explore. It. And that was only 20 minutes, by the way. Nice job. I got a question or two yes. for Bob. Bob. Okay. Hey, Bob. Um, I just want to make sure I'm clear on this by reading this. 
Uh, the budget for the capital program is somewhere around 13 million a year, and our bond payment is 3.8 million. So I just did the math real quick. So about 29% of our money coming in from capital improvements taxes are going out in terms of bond payments. Right. Is that going to be level for the next five years, or do you anticipate that go, is, is there, are we getting to where it makes sense to either refinance those bonds or uh, will some of them drop off? Uh, we're in the middle right now. You all passed a resolution uh, back right before COVID hit, and then we did a revised resolution. You all passed about a meeting or two back. Uh, <clears throat> we were in the process pre-COVID of refinancing uh, at the time the, the arena bonds. And um, knowing that later this year, and specifically this month, we would be also eligible to refinance the, the recovery zone bonds from the radio project. Um, because of COVID, we are now doing both bond issues as a refinancing. It's going to save the county about $2 million over the remaining nine years of the, of the bond term um, that we have running through 2029. What happens with our bond issues is that the arena bonds pay off completely in 2025. And then the radio project pays off in 2029. So we have a bit of a stagger, but we are not extending this bond issue past its original bond terms. So the arena bonds in 2025 will still be paid off in full. And the radio bonds will be paid off in full in 2029. We're not stretching out the debt and paying more interest. Uh, by keeping the structure the same, we're out of debt on, according to the original maturities of the original uh, bond issues that took place and were issued. And we're, we're just not kicking the can down the road, so to speak. And Councilman, but, can I remind you too that we, we did the most minimum restoration of that little piece of the capital improvements tax that fell off so the, that um, 0.5 falls off um, when the arena bonds are paid off because then the arena payments we're going to pick up. So, so your revenue is going to drop then. Right. Okay. For what it's worth, and this is the lowest municipal bond rates I've seen like 30 years, probably right. as long as I've been tracking them. Okay. Right. So, you know, prior to this meeting, you made a very interesting comment and said, Joe, would you please tell me how we can come up with $30 million? Well, if you want to do it, it ain't no cheaper than time to borrow than it is right now. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that may factor into the jail discussion, okay? True. It, it, the bond rates are at historic lows, and that's, that's why, you know, after we went through the craziness right after COVID hit where, where the bond market just fell apart for a while, it's pulled itself to, together pretty quickly at even lesser rates than what were present at prior to COVID. 1.6, 1.8? Yeah. Okay, that's crazy low right, right. now. Right. So, um, and there's there's demand for these bonds out there, so we expect a good sale when we go to, to market on the bonds. But you're right. Right now, the, the bond payments are taking a chunk out of the available revenues out of the capital projects fund every year. Um, on the exhibit that, that we had in the slide show, and I don't know what page that was, the one that showed the capital fund, uh, <coughs> uh, that's the parks there. Yeah, in, in this councilman. It's yep. this, this schedule here. Okay. Um, you can see that the, the family arena bonds drop off and uh, there's a small payment scheduled in 2025 and that's the final year of payment for the family arena bonds. The radio bonds on the recovery zone series play out at a pretty consistent pay payment of around a million three or a little higher than that each year. <laughs> and the only other thing I was going to say on page 26 of the budget under county council, it's got $2,500 for furniture and artwork for the county council chambers. <laughs> I just want everybody to know we have no artwork. That's probably for a frame for the council maps, I'm guessing. And because the budget's so tight, I'll make that frame. So you can take that part out of the budget. <laughs> I'll make one and donate to the county. Okay, so there you Bob, go. Bob, how much money will we lose when that extra tax goes off when we pay out? We go from a quarter cent to uh, to a, a fifth of a cent, so 0.25 to 0 0.20. So we we lose one fifth of the money that we are presently yeah. collecting, yeah. Uh, which five you know two point something million. If dollars. you borrow more, 
you can, you can like this. If you borrow more money on the family arena, does that stay in place? Uh, no. It does not. Does not. not it sunsets either approved. way. It was tied to the right. update of all law enforcement and first responders throughout the entire county for that radio system that supports them. That's okay, the so it drops because the, hips, it right? drops from the radio, not from the arena then. Right. Okay, right. all right. Right. That was one of the things we used to sell it. That it was yeah. temporary as soon as it's paid for. And I was told by, I might be wrong, but some of the municipalities that use it, they said that there's possibility that technology would be obsolete before the, the bonds are paid off. I don't know if that's true. Well, this or not is the true. tower. Yeah. The, 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 this was the tower construction Structure. and the network for that, as well as the, the initial purchase of, of radio equipment. Right. The first buy of radio equipment was on us, mm -hmm. but any future is the responsibility of the municipalities, yeah. right? Yeah. So we put the towers up. Mm -hmm. which is largely what the bonds pay for. Mm -hmm. That that technology is not going away anytime soon. You've got to run the signal somewhere. Okay. Um, what they're probably talking about is the radios they carry on their hips. Right. Mm -hmm. um, first responders usually do one of two things. They run that equipment until it literally falls apart and mm -hmm. the, the thing won't even crackle anymore, mm -hmm. or they want to update you know, on a regular basis. Right. So. We're not, we're not funding a second radio purchase for everybody, so okay. uh, we were expecting they would use them until they're no longer valid. Okay. Uh, while, okay. while we got you up there, uh, do you have the second quarter uh, sales tax revenues? I do. Um, so let me preface this by saying that this is good news, bad news, okay? Because um, on the surface, we are 3% ahead of 2019 through June 30th, but and it's a big but <laughs> because uh, included in those numbers are over $600,000 of one-time money that we are seeing this year and this year only. Um, about half of that money comes from uh, the fact that the when we were paying the TIF, the TIF payments to the city of St. Peter's. The final TIF payment that we made to St. Peter's on the Old Town TIF was made in 2019. We no longer have that payment in 2020. And so when you're comparing the percentages of sales tax and when, when we're reporting those to you, we are netting out the, the, the TIF payments that we make to the cities. It's St. Charles and St. Peter's that we were making TIF payments to last year. So we take the gross collections of sales tax that we receive from the state, and then we reduce our sales tax collections for the money that we have to turn around out of those collections and pay to the cities for the TIF payments. So last year, we made about $300,000 worth of, what, just a little under $300,000 of payments out of the general fund sales tax to the city of St. Peter's. We're not paying that this year. So our percentage goes up accordingly because we don't make that payment this year. So we have more money in the bank one time when we're comparing this year to last year. In addition to the St. Peter's TIF payment, we received a little over $300,000 from the Amazon Distribution Center for sales tax that actually was for the months of July through December of 2019. We received that money in January and in February of 2020. So we have a one-time pickup on that revenue also, but that comes around and, and bites us next year when we're looking at January and February of 2021, where we had this extra one-time payment in, in the bank in 2020. That money's not going to be there in 2021, so that one reverses itself next year, and so it's, it, our percentage will drop by the effect of that little over $300,000 that we're getting this year when we don't get that extra 300000 next year. Well, why why is that? That money really was from last year anyway. It was. It was. And we're that's really, why it's one we're time. We're really down if you look at Correct. it that way. Correct. So that's where I was going. If you look at it that way, we're not up. We're, we're down from last year. So I gave you the good news that we're th on paper, we're 3% ahead of 2019 through June 30th. Under normal circumstances, that would be great. but. When you extract the, the one-time money for the Amazon Distribution Center, 
and for the payment that we're not making to St. Peter's on the TIF this year, we're actually negative by about a half a percent. Well, I don't understand. If we're not having to, to pay St. Peter's for their TIF anymore, right. we still should be getting that tax revenue. We get that, we get that and, revenue, There's, yes. We get that revenue permanently now because we're not making that payment to the city of St. Peter's, but when we're talking about the percentages, the percentages are, are lower one year in 2020 for the fact of not paying that, that payment this year. Next year, in 2021, it's a complete apples to apples because we had the money in 2020, we'll have the, the money in 2021, and our percentage won't be distorted by the, the any one-time money factor. This year, our percentage, the percentages that we usually monitor, is being raised artificially because we're not making that payment this year for the first time. The amount of revenue will be there, yes. But when you're talking in terms of percentages, you have to look at last year on the same terms as you have this year in order to make sure that your percentages are, are an, a true apples to apples comparison. So it's 3% this year. That's uh, true. Well, but, but it won't but be we'll next have, year. We'll have that revenue of like the years going on we will. after this year because we don't have to pay it for the TIF. You're right. We will have, we will have the money, but I'm, I'm qualifying and nobody should walk out of this room thinking that our sales tax revenues are, are up 3% on an ongoing basis or this is a favorable trend that we're going to see because those numbers reverse next year. We have one-time money this year, yes, and we have the cash in the bank this year, yes. And just remembering, though, that the percentages that you're dealing with are, are not true from the, from the illusion that they're giving you that we are up 3% and, and that carries forward. Well, it's all, it's all a gamble what's the next year going to bring anyway, so it doesn't. It is. Or the, it rest, is. Or the rest of this year. Correct? Well, that's why, you know, every year we go through this drill and we watch these percentages monthly as these numbers come in. And sometimes we're there scratching our head as to why, why this actually happens, you know, because we think things are going good and, you know, the fourth quarter comes along for Christmas uh, buying season and all of a sudden it's, it's in the tank. You know, we, in 2018, we had that happen to us. Last year, it didn't happen to us. And I don't know what was different between 2019 Christmas versus 2018 Christmas, but it happened nonetheless. And our, our sales tax revenues were down in 18 and up in 2019 uh, during the Christmas buying season. So after the election, if the state approves uh, taxing online sales, the state will get some of that money too, wouldn't they? I presume they would. Okay. What we're talking about is to, to, to paraphrase John uh, White, this is, these are peanut questions. I'm going to ask you the sirloin steak question, okay? <laughs> All right? Because this is small peanuts money compared to what the question I'm going to ask you. If the state legislature next year would follow the governor's lead, okay, and, and let the counties collect sales tax, the state collect sales tax and the counties get the sales tax on internet purchases like 48 other states have done, okay? Have you scrunched any of the numbers to see what that would do in terms of extra revenue for the county? No, because um, there's too many ifs in, in that world. Um, okay. well, right now, we don't have a true read on what what our true internet sales numbers are. Um, we could you know. look at similar states that enacted that legislation and look what, yeah, they, you could what look they got on a per capita basis. You could they? look at trends that way. Yeah. And, and I, would, I would tell you that I would think that revenues would go up. Mm -hmm. um, but how much, I, I couldn't really tell you. Prop yeah, there's a lot of ifs in that. Probably a lot, though. I think, I yeah, think one, be, one of the most... In a COVID world, you look at those Amazon and all the other trucks around, although we're collecting some on Amazon now. We are. We're collecting yeah. about $85,000 a month in Amazon sales tax. Okay. Do we know what percentage of the market is Amazon? I'm sorry? 
<clears throat> if we know we get 80% for Amazon and we know what percent of the market Amazon has, no. can we do that? I think in January. Can we determine then what, how much additional revenue we would get? Why do we only get 80? Um, I don't really know, honestly. I haven't looked at any of this, any of that. I wouldn't get 100%. Well, you know, I, I think one. See, it said you get 80% of Amazon's. Okay, why would we get, not get 100% of what they collect? So if Amazon first nationally entered into an agreement to voluntarily collect sales tax, Along the lines, and they did. And they in keep 20% in their pocket? No, 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 no. So what you have to look at, though, is the complexities fee. of Missouri sales tax law along with Amazon's distribution program. So, for instance, now that there's a distribution center in this county, that is under Missouri sales tax law, not its use tax law. So Amazon is going to pay the uh, point of sale, which is often for um, <coughs> goods that they actually distribute, if they're coming out of that distribution center, the um, city of St. Peter's gets its sales tax and we get ours. Um, if it's a use tax item, it's coming from Illinois or it's coming from right. Chicago or whatever, then, um, the, then it's point of delivery. And so we're still getting a use tax. If it's delivered in St. Peter's, they get nothing. If it's delivered in O'Fallon now or uh, Wentzville, they have a use tax. Uh, but you would have to have a use tax to get it. Other states have, have joined that uh, SSTA streamline. streamline. Right. Has Missouri talked about doing that at all? Missouri's talked about everything. Yeah. And, 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 and for what it's worth, for what it's worth, I never have a conversation with a state rep or a state senator that I don't bring up the fact that we need to collect on use tax, our, our, our internet taxes, and we need to think about uh, raising fuel tax. I mean, I hammer them every time I see them. Probably the point yeah. that they don't want to talk to me anymore because those are two things that would significantly help our budget. Okay, yeah. no other way around it. I think if we've learned anything from from COVID recently, at least people, especially in the older age brackets, is that because of COVID, people have become more adept at ordering things online than they were six months ago or eight months ago. People are way more comfortable doing it right. than they were six months ago. And that's well, just going to lead to a decrease in you know, exactly. RCS tax. Uh, that as well as Zoom and Teams and everything else that people are doing online now that, that most people didn't do pre-COVID. You know, that we've, we've been forced into adaptation of uh, uh, our lifestyles to be socially distanced and, and electronically connected as opposed to being in person. And uh, that goes along uh, right hand in hand with Amazon and what they do, so yeah. Okay. Um, any, any more questions for Bob? All right. Mr. Uh, Elam, uh, would you like to uh, bring up the point that you were trying to bring up earlier? So after seeing all of these great reports, and thank you all for spending the time and, and telling us all about that, what's our plan for actually overcoming the fact that we have a lot less money than what we're expecting to spend? Um, our, our plan as staff is, is that there is a certain amount of money that comes into the county and when we give you budgets, we have to stay within that. <laughs> we can't manufacture money. Um, we'll just keep working on solutions, but uh, you know, we're looking, Bob's been looking at what are the possibilities with bonding, how would we pay for the bonds, you still have to have an income stream. So it's, you know, the, we talked, what, probably six years ago in Steve's administration to the state delegation about the fact that, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even the 80s, largely you purchased within a certain mileage radius of where your home was. Your businesses, except for big ones like yours, Joe, where you're moving heavy equipment around the country, purchased within a certain radius. And so as the economy grew, our new businesses came to town, your sales tax grew at the same time. That was the whole theory of County Executive Orworth and County Executive Elements move to try to really curtail the property tax in this county because property tax is so onerous on 
on especially older or fixed income homeowners. Right. But um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that with internet purchasing the way it is, and, and as you just pointed out, the way it's expanding, that old model of how you funded government services doesn't really hold true anymore. Right. And on top of that, you have the complexities of some of the costs of modernizing government, like the internet and virtual experience that our um, citizens appreciate so much, and that really helped us through COVID, by the way, um, are also fairly expensive technologies. I was teasing Matthew a little bit that I found the 1994 capital plan, or 93, and it's like they were gonna solve the whole um, computer problem of the county. They budgeted a million bucks over two years. That was gonna do it. And um, That won't even pay your Microsoft bill now, will it? Yeah. I don't think so. So, you know, the government is, is more complex. Um, you know, you were talking before about how do you get inmates up to the state? Well, you need prosecutors and public defenders to, to move people through the due process that they're entitled to. Um, the court wants, you know, certain things. They've got a public administrator that has a huge and very complex now mental health caseload because the state's largely gotten out of the management of people with developmental disabilities and mental illness that's falling on local public administrators. They want a court administrator. There are people that we need to do plan reviews if we're gonna get developers or plan review in a timely manner. So all those things are sort of coming down on us as well as in general uh, what the marketplace is going for and where we are with compression in the, in the middle group of our employees. But you're not going to fix that probably with just a Wayfair fix because the legislature has very much talked about if they're going to increase any kind of revenue through a Wayfair fix, they want to decrease other revenues. Right. So, you know, our job is uh, to keep reminding you of where we are and what, you know, we're hearing from the departments of what we'd like to do, but it's also our job to produce a budget that's within the revenues that we actually have. There ain't a single fix to this. It's going to take a whole bunch of little fixes added up to fix it. One thing, Steve, I think you said, well, about how much money have we spent on MoDOT projects that MoDOT should have paid for? Ninety million. Ninety million dollars. So if you take care of the ninety, if you had, we had that ninety million dollars that we spent on MoDOT, MoDOT project, MoDOT paid for it with a fuel tax, which the legislature should have did because at a dollar six fifty seventy cents a gallon, who cares about two couple pennies a gallon? We'd have $90 million more in road and bridge to take care of some of the problems that we talked about earlier today, okay? You know, the sales tax would help some. I mean, there's a whole lot of little, little things that would add up that might plug the hole, but you know, there's, it's gonna be tough. We talked a lot about, you know, different possibilities and different attitudes, and, you know, what we're up against to try to get more revenue. But the problem is that uh, all that was based upon all of our combined experience over the last 20 or 30 years. And as we've all found out with this COVID, there's no, there's no playbook. I don't know. You tell me, are, are people more or less likely to want to give us more revenue now than they than they were a year ago? I think um, from from what just, just from dealing with the retail side, okay, I think you're going to have to do a damn good selling job, okay. And I think they've got they're going to look at value. They're not looking at price. They're looking for value right now. So if you tell them what the the shape that we're in. And the fact that if we don't do something, this and this and this is going to happen. And if, and if we do something, this and this happen, and we do a really good job of educating them, I think they would, they would uh, be more, more open to it. But I think they're going to want us to exhaust every avenue we have, like state legislature, to get the state legislature to do something with the state fuel tax, like doing something with the, and, and I don't think the governor's planning on reducing the revenue. I think that's Eigel's idea, the reduced revenue <coughs> by, by amount equal to the general internet sales tax collection, which I think that's a terrible bad idea. But uh, I mean, if, if the people think that we're in no other way we can fix it, we can't fix it through our state legislature, <coughs> state legislatures, and we've got no other choice, and you do a good enough job pitching to them, I think, that, I think they, would, they would help because they care about the county <coughs> government. Okay? I think they really do. So. I, don't know. I mean, there's there's good signs in the economy too, uh, but I, I just don't know. 
what people's attitude would be. I think everybody's assumed they'd be less likely to support any kind of revenue increase, but I don't know what's going to happen the next, uh, you know, I really thought, I mean, I thought three or four months ago we would be, you know, closer to the end of this COVID thing. Now I'm just not, I'm just not sure. I hope we are, but I don't, I don't know. I think this was a good session. I, I asked Terry to consider doing this, and, and I think if nothing else, it shows the public that we really think hard and work hard before we spend their money. So I, th I thank you, Terry, for calling us. Well, I think the, the, the big thing here is that we had took, were able to take some time, which obviously at our regular meeting, there's no way we could take this amount of time just to have a lot of these things explained to us, you know, in, in detail, whereas uh, many times it's just kind of, you know, this is kind of uh, a general overview. So, yes. So I appreciate knowing where we're at, mm -hmm. but I feel like we need to do some sort of take-home work at this point um, because, A, I think we need to figure out something with this jail project, and we need to move forward on that in, in a vote or something, but we need to do something to actually get that part figured out. Secondly, I think we need to figure out what are recommendations that we want to look at for additional revenue ideas, whether or not we're going to go to the voters and ask for that or not, we need to at least be discussing those ideas and put them forward. I didn't know if the administration tonight was coming. I heard you say we need additional revenue a number of different times. I didn't know if you were going to make a recommendation, which is why before Matthew stood up, I, I said that because I felt that that's what was coming. So I'm guessing that's a no. Okay, so I, just asking. So then I guess we need to possibly consider some work sessions to talk about additional revenue ideas because it's pretty obvious over the next five years we're going to spend more than we're going to bring in so or we won't we'll stay within our means but that means um, to Joe's point uh, not only Matthew's department is going to lose a million dollars so is everybody else and we uh, Ryan congratulations we can't take from parks to give it to someone else so you're good. I hope to see more paddle boards because my daughter's into paddle boarding. So at least she'll be happy. Uh, we'll all be poor, but she'll get to paddle board. So we'll have that to move forward. But I think we need to figure out something. Otherwise, we're going to walk out of here going, we're informed, but we're not doing anything. So I, I think we need as a council to agree to set up some sort of work session moving forward and not wait until 2021 to start doing that. I think we need to look at that now and figure out what that looks like because money's as cheap as it's probably ever going to be in our lifetime. I could be wrong, but like you said, you've been looking at bonds for over 30 years and money's never been this cheap. And that's all I keep hearing about. Uh, when you have 0% interest rates out there, if you need to bite a bullet, now's the time to bite it. Um, so I'm, I'm just thinking we need to spend some time and have some hard discussions and figure out what we're going to do. And I think this is a real good exercise for the council too, yeah. because we are blessed that we have an honest county executive, okay? There Our neighbor go. to the east wasn't so blessed. And I read skin scan through that audit report that came from the state, and they clearly stated the county council in St. Louis County should have watched the dollars a little closer. So I don't feel that we, none of us feel like we have that urgency with you, Steve, because you're an honest guy. Maybe you can have Brett stand up and take a bow. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> congratulations. Good job. Got, got he, some, did, he did, what, eight to their two with ha a third as much money or something yes, like that? Got some yes. good press for us there, Brett. But, but there unless go. we figure out a way to clone Steve, our next county executive may not be so good. So there you go. Is there anything, anything else? I, I, I agree with Mike. I think, you know, did something down the line here. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at this. We'll maybe give, give the council uh, some, some time to start thinking about some things and maybe talk to some people in the administration about, you know, uh, directions that they think might be, you know, feasible. Yeah. And then talk about this again, you know, prior to the end of the year, definitely. And, of course, obviously we got budget coming up, which is probably not going to be a pleasant experience this year. It ne never is, but this year I don't think it's going to be uh, any better for sure. Yeah, it wasn't pleasant last year. No. So I'm sure this year is not going to be better. Okay. All right. All so right. motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Accepted. Thank you. Appreciate it, folks.